Good morning. Um, I'll be session sharing here. Um, my name's Winnie, and I'll be introducing um, Oren Shaw. Oren is a DevOps consultant person from Wellington, New Zealand. She wrote the formative article on contempt culture and focuses on the cultural requirements of DevOps and how the culture of a team can restrict damage technical capability. She really likes Salt Stack and has a lot of opinions. You should ask her about them. <laughs> um, just a brief warning. Um, this talk's going to go over time, so if you need to leave at the 30 minute mark, please do. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Oren. As noted, it will go over 30 minutes, probably not more than about 33. As Winnie mentioned, I am Oren. You may have already heard of me from the third longest running internet shouting match, generally known as Twitter. <laughs> uh, by day, I'm founder and principal consultant at IARA, and we're a DevOps consultancy based in Wellington. And one of the core things we focus on is working to ensure the success of technical change by helping clients on the cultural side of the DevOps journeys. And DevOps is a really interesting journey. And for me, it was a journey that started with a focus on the technology. And while technology is really cool, I mean, I like programming, one of the other things I've learned over the last few years is that it's also a complete head fake. And if you've not heard the term head fake before, I learned it from Dr. Randy Posh's The Last Lecture. Now, Dr. Posh was a lecturer and researcher in the 90s. Uh, and he, he used the term in his talk to describe offering his students one thing, which is often tools, with the goal of getting them to learn something completely different. And so when I say DevOps is a head fake, I'm saying that these excellent tools aren't the goal, or even the most interesting part. Instead, DevOps uses tools to drive cultural changes. The tools ask us to change how we view the needs of people who aren't on our teams, who don't know what we know, and do things that we don't know. And this is in the name, that portmanteau of developer and operations. It asks us to break down the walls of separation, seeing our skills on a spectrum, and asking, how do I make their life easier? Crucially, it asks us to help others to belong. Because there's always been that hard split between devs and ops, and our culture has taught us to do that. Our culture defines the other side as interlopers, as unable to do what we do, as lesser. From the dev side of things, operations is held as less skilled or less important. This attitude is because sysadmins don't know how to code, and therefore their opinions aren't worth paying attention to. All operations is there to do is wire up the bits, not do that real creative work, the important work of actually developing a system nothing to do more than maintain these things made by other people. And on the flip side, devs are referred to as inept, unable to be trusted with any level of systems privilege, because they will wreck things and make things harder for ops. After all, devs don't know what it's like at 3 in the morning when production is down and everyone's screaming. Devs just want to log in and make that one change, having no conception of that difficulty that this entails. And historically, the groups haven't really overlapped. Each has their own cultures and their own attitudes. And that split has harmed others' DevOps journeys, myself included. And this is a struggle due to being seen by ops people as a dev, the bumbling fool that that entails. Being seen by devs as ops, all of the, well, they don't know how to code. And this disregards that DevOps is its own unique set of skills. And a lot of this behavior derives from contempt culture, which you may have heard me talk about before. And for those that haven't, contempt culture is the idea that we gain status in our communities through displays of contempt towards things that the community has decided are inferior. For devs as a whole, this is positioning ops as inferior. Ops isn't coding. It's less complex. It means that ultimately they are not worth our time. Ops people have their own contemptuous displays. Loser, for example. Devs took this one up too. The 1D10T error. The problem exists between keyboard and chair error. The loser attitude readjustment tool, aka a 2x4. 
the long-running series of the bastard operator from hell. All of this is treated as catharsis, the wish fulfillment of visiting harm upon being forced to serve those below our station. And this is a slice of the culture that we live in. We show we belong when we perform it. We claim that we are valid parts of the conversation, we have, or that we have our own war stories of 3 a.m. wake-up calls. And it's all because we know the right stuff, right? Well, I lied a little bit. And I said that contempt culture is how we gain status through displaying contempt. Uh, but it's more nuanced than that. It's also showing that we desire to be a part of the group. It shows that I am like you, that I know the community values, that I fit in. Because displaying contempt is presenting an argument, asking people on the inside to consider our worth, putting ourselves up for judgment as to whether we truly belong. We ask to be judged if we have the right knowledge, knowledge like PHP is an objectively bad language. Look at the vulnerabilities in it, how bad everything written in it is. But this isn't just pointing out that we've decided that PHP is bad. It's also saying that we know that PHP users are incompetent. After all, if they were competent, they would be able to use good languages, languages like Python. This is the knowledge and values that the broader tech community holds. They're the right words the right ways of showing that we should be welcomed here with all of you. But are they the right words? So before I moved to New Zealand, I lived in Calgary in Canada, and I was at a meetup. And this was a really large meetup, somewhere between 150 and 200 people. And this was in a pub with a big multi-level atrium. And at the beginning, like most meetups, they had a space for job advertisements. And this is pretty standard stuff. You would have seen it in any meetup here. And someone stood up and asked for .NET developers. Now, at the time, Calgary was an oil and gas town. Lots of big oil companies, so lots of Windows-based infrastructure. .NET was big and important. And I, well, I shouted out into the darkness in front of 150 to 200 people that, that they should get a real language. Can you imagine doing that? And there I was, doing that. And I could make any number of excuses for it, but it all came down to thinking that that was acceptable because the culture I existed in thought that that was okay. I'd felt like I was an outsider there. I'd never been to this meetup before. This was the first meetup I'd ever been to. And I needed to show that I belonged, that I wasn't an imposter. But why? Well, we need to go back further to how I was allowed into programming at all. One of the earliest narratives we're introduced to in tech is the idea of passion as an indicator of belonging. We idolize passion. We consider it to be a critical requirement of our coworkers. Because being passionate in our culture means spending all of the time you can on your computer, doing programming, thinking programming. And because we bought into, as a culture, the idea of the 10,000 hour problem, more computer is better computer. And this idea of passion leads to the self-taught narrative, which is the idea that anyone who taught themselves to code on their own from a book and online resources is going to be better at coding because they wanted it more than someone who just found computer science at a university, which glorifies these self-taught programmers as lone geniuses. They bootstrapped themselves into advanced knowledge through their own ability and intellect. And so when I started, and I mean really started, I picked a language. Now, I had been smart enough to be born to a father who programmed. So I had access to computers and books from a very early age. 
And I was on the internet from a very young age, again, because of my excellent choice in parental. Um, so I got to see examples of what languages I should be using. So I ended up starting out with Perl. <laughs> and with Perl, I started out writing web apps. And this was the late 90s. So when I was coding, a lot of the web apps at the time were already written in Perl. Perl was the language of the web. And at the time, there were places like Matt's Script Archive, the web programs that you could set up and run. But I was writing really bad web apps. But I was allowed to write them. They weren't an indicator that the language is bad, just that I was young and bad at programming. But I was really passionate, driven. I was learning all by myself. And the broader community rewards that with acceptance, with help. So I took the self-taught narrative, and I've succeeded at it. But what I'd done was learned a blessed language. Like C, at the time, Perl was considered a real language, a good language. And by using it, I was considered to be a real programmer. But I can draw an identical self-taught narrative. Someone who started out editing HTML and CSS, like I did, to ex adapt existing websites. Who learned enough to make simple changes to the apps themselves, adding little features and tweaks. Learned more than that. Learned to make deep and complicated changes, you know, changing fundamental aspects of the program they were working with, to finally becoming a programmer who could start a new project from scratch and make something unique and cool. Someone who followed the exact same self-taught narrative that I had, but used PHP instead. And now let's think about that. When I say PHP, the first words that almost always jump to mind are bad, or insecure, or a variety of curse words. But this person did everything I did in exactly the same way, walked the same path to gain knowledge, just with a different language. One that wasn't blessed by the rest of the culture is acceptable. And so their self-taught narrative is erased. Because as we covered earlier, we believe that PHP users are incompetent. Not because they are or are not bad programmers, but because we believe that anyone good at programming would be using a different language, that they would know better. And this isn't an archetype. This isn't someone I've made up. Many, many people came to me after I wrote Contempt Culture and described this. This was their story. A story identical to mine with that one exceedingly trivial difference that they learned PHP instead of Perl. So why do we do this? Well, it comes down to bias. Now, bias isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means our predispositions to looking at things. We all have lots of harmless biases. For instance, I am biased towards macOS. There's nothing objectively better about it. I've just been using it for 15 years. And the longer I've used it, the more it's changed me, the more it's become normal. Using Linux or Windows will impart the same bias, becomes the background against which we look at problems. Because, and being in a group biases you towards that group. That group becomes normal. It's just what's all around you every day. Like the light, it just is. So let's talk about people coming into our communities and how our biases affect that. Let's talk about Bob and Rakesh. They're the same age, they have identical CVs, but first we'll sit down with Bob. And Bob is great. We get along right away. Bob grew up in Australia. He laughs along with us as we joke about the school experiences and has so many jokes. Everything just clicks and we have great rapport. We pitch the tech questions at Bob and we can see how he's thinking straight away because we've already meshed so well. He didn't get all the answers right, but that doesn't matter. We're seeing how he got there. And we know we would have made the same mistakes. So we can see just how he'll pick up the patterns, how he'll grow. Bob's great. 
And then we sit down with Rakesh. And it just doesn't click. We can't get that rapport going. Rakesh didn't grow up in Australia. His English is great, but he's just not laughing at the jokes. Every clever reference is an awkward silence. And so we focus more on the CV, the, the point of common ground, his knowledge of the tech. And we grill him hard. We write down everything he gets wrong. But because we never found that rapport, we never started to see how he thinks, we don't know why he got the answers wrong, just that he got them wrong. All we can see is that he doesn't know what we need him to know. And the interview ends. And Rakesh falls off our shortlist. He just doesn't know the tech, we say. He's just too junior for what we need. So we hire Bob. But as I mentioned, in this example, Bob and Rakesh have identical CVs. All that was different was how we reacted to them. And there are many, many studies that exist on this effect. But say we did hire Rakesh. Well, we still don't know how he thinks or how he'll learn. Maybe we still think he's too junior. So we watch him closely, try to learn how he thinks, how he's learning, how he's fitting in. And we watch every time he gets up to play ping pong because we're a tech startup. That means we have culture, right? We count every time he gets up to play ping pong. And in our review, we bring it up with him. He plays too much ping pong. He's too junior to be away from his work. He needs to focus more. But we also hired Bob. Bob's still great. He plays even more ping pong than Rakesh. We just don't see it. It's just Bob, you know? It's just how Bob blows off steam. We know he's thinking the whole time, chewing on that problem. He'll get back to his desk and be even more effective. We know Bob. We know how he thinks, how he learns. And we can see the ideas he'll have, how he got there. He fits in brilliantly. And this is bias to what's normal, to what we already know, to what is consistent with our world. And we do it without recognizing that we are. And so we see Bob is more deserving, Rakesh is less deserving, because Bob fits what we already know coding skill looks like, because he's normal. And this is one of the tests of belonging that we impose upon our communities. There are others deep within the usability of our tools. And we can see this when we laud the command line as the only interface that real programmers use. When GUIs are referred to as point and drool or Fisher Price, which are real terms that I have consistently used, heard used to describe GUI environments. It's contempt for environments that work to make computing more accessible and have fewer barriers to easy adoption. There's nothing magical or more advanced about the command line, so. Why do we consider a hostile interface from the mid-1970s designed to be used by printers to be superior to interfaces that have undergone considerable human-computer interface research, have been examined by user interface experts? Because the command line is from the mid-1970s, because it's inscrutable and difficult, the more difficult the thing is to use, the more it demonstrates mastery, superiority, and adherence to what we consider normal. This is an expression of our power, the way we gatekeep when we sneer, oh, you don't use the command line? This makes teaching new users on Windows vastly harder because our tools are vessels of our contempt. We've built them specifically to resist being used in accessible environments. Even worse than this is there are legitimate reasons to use the command line, excellent reasons. Some tasks are considerably easier. But when we heap scorn on those who do not use the command line, we poison it. We poison our ability to show other approaches, other solutions to people's problems. So let's go back to PHP. Why is PHP so hated? The major reason I'm always told is that it's insecure. The code is bad. But that's not the real reason. Instead, let's go back to when I learned to code in the late 1990s. PHP was a few years old at this point. But it was already eating a lot of developer mindshare for building websites, making it easier to get more people into programming. 
This was acting to erode the dominance of Perl as the language of the web. Because PHP was easier. It was much easier to bring up an Apache server to just run PHP for testing. It was easier to get on a shared web host. It was so much easier to just inline some HTML and get something that worked quickly. But these people weren't coming from our existing communities. They didn't obey our existing power structures. They were newcomers. So PHP became not real. People who used it were excluded and told they weren't programmers. But these people still wanted to make things. The web was huge at that point, getting bigger. So they shared their code. Code that didn't have habits that our communities considered secure or good. And so PHP earned a reputation of insecure or bad, not because it was insecure or bad, but because the users were excluded from the communities, which fulfills its own prophecy. And obviously, PHP is so bad that the biggest and most influential website in the world, Facebook, is written in it. The most important chat system we have ever found so far, Slack, is written in it. So when we say that PHP is an objectively bad language, all we're saying is that our culture thinks it's bad because it is taking a subjective viewpoint from history and making it into an objective cultural ideal. I'm also old enough to remember when Rails came out and, again, heaped so much contempt upon it. Active Record did everything wrong in terms of database access. No foreign key constraints, in-app sorting. This was terrible. And Ruby, oh, it's so slow. But without Rails, we don't have GitHub. We don't have Twitter. We don't have Ravelry. Other many important digital artifacts. Our lives are fundamentally changed by what Rails enabled. Because Rails made things easier. It didn't matter that database integrity was compromised. It mattered that it enabled people to do new things more easily. It enabled us to grow and met contempt for that. And this isn't the only example of this. There are so many. For instance, there is Jykstra saying, it is practically impossible to teach good programming to students that have had a prior exposure to BASIC. As potential programmers, they are mentally mutilated beyond hope of regeneration. Jykstra's Illuminary came up with how we fa perform fast graph traversals. Facebook could not exist without his research. And he perpetuated contempt culture. BASIC was one of the first languages I ever touched. I wouldn't be here without it. But it's held in contempt because it makes things easier. And making things easier means it undermines the power of those who already belong. And it puts the previously powerful in the position where their belonging is questioned, where they have to prove, once again, that they belong, that they deserve to be here. And all of these things add up to the falsehood of meritocracy. We tell ourselves that we're judging people on their merits, the languages they know or the patterns that they have mastered. But when Bob is no more skilled or knowledgeable than Rakesh, and PHP is held in such low regard, what we are judging is not technical skill, merely similarity to ourselves. We think those closest to us will have stronger technical skills, but only because we see ourselves in them. We understand how they think, they will act and grow. Because their similarity reinforces that our choices were correct. Their similarity reinforces our power, our sense of belonging. And none of these choices will individually feel wrong. None of it will ever feel like we've made the wrong choice. It always feels like we're making good decisions. But all of these decisions add up to very exclusionary outcomes. Our actions decided that people don't deserve to belong. We didn't intend for it to happen, but it happened. It's done. We did that. 
And as a result, we have founded our communities on insecurity, doubt, and fear. We build fear that we won't know the right shared knowledge, that we will be a fraud, that we won't laugh at the right jokes, that we'll have used the wrong tools, that we don't use the right tools. And as a result, we live in fear. And our communities reinforce that fear. Imposter syndrome is a big deal in tech. It's really easy to find it all around us. I struggle with imposter syndrome right here, right now, in front of all of you. Believing that I deserve to be here can be hard. Not just here on stage, but here at the conference, among all of you, here in Melbourne. Almost everyone I talk to feels this way, feels like they don't belong here, feels like they'd be a real dev if only they knew more about compiler theory or databases or backend programming or CSS or whatever. The common thread isn't technology that real devs use, but that we judge ourselves against an unattainable archetype of what realness is. And so when someone asks something that we don't know, or when someone or something doesn't work as we expected, and we have to go and ask, this is terrifying. Because asking shows that we don't know something. And not knowing means we don't belong, because a real dev would have known. And for me, every day has that anxiety. What don't I know? What should I have said? What do people actually really think of me? What would a real DevOps know? And we all walk on that razor's edge of not fitting the right mold, of being seen as ignorant of the correct knowledge, which leaves us afraid that we will be seen as a fraud because we no longer meet expectations, leaving us in fear of the judgment, fear of asking, fear that we will be mocked because we know PHP or because we do front-end web development, and that we will no longer be real. And when realness isn't a mark of can write programs, but only fits the expectations, we fear our, the expectations will shift and that we will no longer be welcome. And so, under contempt culture, we are constantly required to, to reassert that our knowledge is valid, that we are correct, and that outside ideas are wrong, that we are not naive and helpless like devs, that we can actually build things, unlike ops that we know better than to write PHP or Java or use Windows, <coughs> that we're not a designer who exists only to make things pretty, that we're not a lowly user, that most hated class in all of computing, that we are real and not an imposter. And we act this way, we fight for our realness because imposter syndrome is a desired effect. Let that sink in. Our culture, our communities. I will let you all finish taking photos. <laughs> One more, no, two more, three more. One, two, and cool. Demand that we have imposter syndrome. Constantly reassert that we belong because we must be better than outsiders, better than non-programmers, better than users, because only then can we belong. And so we push others down to elevate ourselves. We show that we are unbounded by social norms of politeness or respect, that we are the wizards, the ninjas, the rock stars, the 10x engineers. We show that we are good enough while never being permitted to believe it. Everything I've covered so far has been an analysis of a system, an analysis of the choices that we make and how we keep choosing to make them, an analysis of what refusing to acknowledge the system costs us, where we choose to keep doing this to ourselves to use contempt culture as the driving forces in our communities. We choose to do it when we claim PHP is awful or when we bash Java 
as I saw from a speaker at PyCon AU 2015. We choose to do it when we sneer at front-end development, call it not real programming. We choose to do it when our tools barely work on Windows. And seeing this system is so much harder than most, because the natural reaction to this being pointed out is to deny that you have done it, because people who do this must be bad people. I'm not a bad person. I must never have done these things. And that defensiveness is normal. I was defensive when these things were pointed out to me because I felt bad about it. I felt ashamed, like I was a bad person. And in so many ways, I've never stopped feeling like a bad person. Every time I think of that night in Calgary, I am so ashamed. And this is a natural response to suddenly looking at everything that we have ever done in a new and unflattering light. A light that makes us feel like bad people, like we have done irreparable harm. We have done irrevocable harm. We can never undo the past. But this does not make us bad people. But it does mean that we have done things with negative outcomes. It means we have perpetuated contempt culture because it was all around us, because it was normal. But a lack of awareness does not mean a lack of responsibility. We have still done these things, still made our industry exclusionary and hostile, as if you've been watching Twitter, the Google thing today. But now we have awareness, and we can see what we've done. And in awareness of what we've done, in seeing with a new light, we are given a new choice. We can choose to ignore everything we've done, choose to ignore our cult that our culture has negative outcomes, that our culture by its very nature gives us all imposter syndrome. We can choose to make ourselves feel bad, to regret the past that we cannot change, the things that cannot be undone. We can choose to keep believing that our actions do not have consequences. Or we can choose to change, to accept responsibility for our actions and ask ourselves, is this who I want to be? Accepting responsibility will be difficult. It requires admitting that we have done things that we are not proud of. And facing our shame, that for all of our intentions we have still done harm, requires seeking new viewpoints, understanding new tools, new ways of thinking, and tools like the code of conduct, which came about because of people deciding to stop perpetuating this system. My time is up, so if you need to go, um, I'm almost done. I mean, considering what we do not as a demonstration of our mastery, but as an enabler, asking how what we do helps others. It means treating other fields and other skills with respect and valuing their contributions. Understanding that coding is not the most important part it means that PHP is never you. Instead, the beginning of, wow, show me that cool thing you've made. It means that from today onward, you have a choice. I have described a system, and now you are aware not only of what you have done, but what you can do, that you can choose to help make this a better culture, a better industry, a better community, one where we all belong, one where we all ask, is this really who we want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So as a token of appreciation, you get a mug. Cool. A mug. Best mug. <laughs> thank you all very much. And thank you for the winning.